right now. Did you really think the Harlem Globetrotters were a real team? <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I, I kind of hoped of some form of... So, yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Just admit it. Yes, I did. So, can you that bubble go then? <laughs> it was sad that he was like, the Washington team, they're really going to do it this time. i got a strong feeling. <laughs> what, what do you mean? <laughs> well, at least Father Christmas won't let you down. <laughs> some of them, some of them names are global trotters. It kind of, I should have really realised that. It's as if they're not real. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Who'd have thought? Then you'd have gotten away with it, you know, if I hadn't been for these pesky kids. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know that. <laughs> but I suppose while we're on the topic of basketball. Okay, so the BBL has been established in England for many years now. Uh, there are a lot of dominant foundation teams still going today. A lot of those foundation teams. Um, from the likes of Newcastle, from Manchester, and uh, at one point there was even a team close to our hearts, which were the Mersey Tigers, uh, they were formerly the Everton Tigers, but unfortunately uh, they, you know, they've passed by the wayside, but one of the long-standing members of the BBL that was there pretty much from the start was uh, shooting guard number 14 for the Phoenix, David Alliou. Now I sat down with David to ask him, you know, about his time in the BBL and how he felt the Knicks have done this season. I started playing uh, at a young age, 14, with the Toxic Tigers uh, originally, um, and I was able to, you know, go on and get a scholarship to go and play in the States. I played there for two years in high school and I played four years in college and then turned pro, and it took me all around Europe and the rest of the world. So yeah, it was uh, a great thing for me, and it was good to be able to get out there and experience all that. You even had some time over in in Iceland and also some time in Spain as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, played in Iceland for I think around two and a half, two, two, two and a half years. I was in Iceland. Uh, enjoyed it. Uh, beautiful place. Cold, of course, but it was nice. Um, and I was in Spain for around two years as well, which also was a great thing. I was in the north of Spain and also down in the south. So it was, it was a nice thing to do, being over there. It's nice to be able to travel and, and get paid for you know seeing yeah. the world, which is priceless for me. Always nice if you can afford it. <laughs> uh, now, born and bred in Liverpool, how does a scouse lad like yourself end up graduating in America? <laughs> It was just um, one of those things where, you know, I took to play football at a young age, like most people in Liverpool, took to basketball because, you know, um, I didn't like playing outside in the cold. And then uh, I progressed pretty quickly, to be honest. I started playing at 14, so I progressed quite fast. I uh, started playing for England and started getting spotted by, you know, coaches from the States and different academies and stuff like that. And then got offered a scholarship to go over there and play. And then once I went to the States, I think at the age of 15, and I went from there, you know, I was able to secure a scholarship to a Division One college in uh, Kentucky. Played there for four years at a university called Moorhead State, and then obviously from there turned professional. So I was fortunate, but to be fair, you know, I, put, I, did, I did put the work in, I, I put my mind something, and that was what I was able to do. Because, you know, when you're from a city like Liverpool, and nobody else has ever gone to, to America from Liverpool and done that, you know, you're up against a lot, but you know, I was able to overcome that, thankfully. Now, how different is it playing at the American level, even at high school level, and the Euro Leagues, compared to what you'd say the BBL? Just the uh, competitive nature, I mean, especially in the States, it's born and bred, you know, it's, it's, it's instilled in, in the people, it's, it's a big basketball country, so, you know, the, the thing is over there, you know, facilities, you know, they've got probably the best facilities in the world, and, you know, obviously it's the size of America as well, so the competition you're playing, there's, there's never an easy night, that you're always playing tough competition. And would you say the atmosphere is different over there? Yeah, yeah, totally, especially because, like I say, it's, it's a basketball, the sport is big in the States, but it, it's a really big place for basketball, and... So it's instilled in them, so it's almost like the football is here for us. The state basketball is out there alongside American football and baseball. Well, you, picking up on that reference there between basketball and, and football over here, people say that you know, uh, if an away team came to, say, Anfield or Old Trafford, it's an intimidating arena to play yeah. at. Was there anywhere that you felt the sort of intimidate you or carried that presence with you in the basketball? Yeah, definitely. Um, throughout my college career, I, I went to a university called Moorhead State, and we, we played against the University of uh, Kentucky University, which at the time were the, the best university in the States. So, you know, you're playing up until like 22, 23,000 people sold out. I mean, and obviously, Kentucky is a huge basketball state. So, the actual noise and the atmosphere, it was a bit overwhelming. But to experience at a young age, it made it easy for me going into the professional level. Now, do you feel that there's more accessibility for uh, kids nowadays um, to maybe progress and go further? Uh, than there was for yourself back then, or do you feel it was a better setup back then if you wanted to progress and become a higher level? No, I think there's definitely more opportunities now for the young ones coming through. You know, there's a lot of people like myself, you know, over the years who've who've gone through the system. You know, not so much the hard way, but have been able to, you know, get there. You know, by themselves or with the help of one or two people. But now the way it seems, because that many people have gone over the, to the states and to Europe and played at a high level, they're able to, you know, 
bridge gaps and help the other youngsters coming through to get over there. So I think it's definitely a lot easier now and there's a lot more opportunities for the youngsters to go and do it. Now it's fair to say you are a veteran of the BBL. Most noticeably one of your highest accomplishments was the treble winning season with the Mersey Tigers back in the 2010-2011 season. How exciting was that for you? I mean it's amazing, it's a dream come true for me because I've always wanted, from a young age, I always said I'd love to have played in front of friends and family in Liverpool. I wish we had a professional basketball team. And just so happened that that opportunity arose. And to be able to, to, you know, to win the treble and be a part of that in my home city, it's like, for me, it was uh, one of the biggest accomplishments to be able to do that. Can you remember throughout that season at what point you suddenly went, hang on boys, we could actually do this here? Well, yeah, I mean, I knew we had a special group of guys because when you go and play for teams, you know, it, Everybody doesn't always get on or mesh, you know, sometimes it takes a lot of time. But from day one, the team that we had along with the coach, um, everybody gelled and, you know, everybody had the same objectives. Everybody came in to try and make a statement that year and, and win something and prove a few points. And um, so you could tell from the very beginning that, you know, something was going to happen. And obviously we just made sure we put, we put the effort in and the time and that showed throughout the season. Now, it was an unfortunate, uh, shall we say, instance that the following season from that, that great win and the treble, that the Mersey Tigers had a really bad season and subsequently dropped out the BBL. Can you shine any light on that for us? Yeah, it just down. To, it was due to a lot of changes. You know, throughout the course of all maybe two, three seasons, there was a lot of change going on behind the scenes, different new owners and different management and stuff like that. So I think the transition of the, the change, I think it was just too great of a task for the, the new owners coming in to try and uphold. And it started to struggle. You know, going into midway through that second season, as you were discussing then. So could you ever see maybe the uh, rebirth of the Mersey Tigers? Or I'd love that to be. I mean, it's not only you know not only for me because I'm from Liverpool, but just for all the youngsters in Liverpool, give them something to aspire to and you know and thrive for. I remember the very first game I played in Liverpool in the Echo Arena. It was like seven thousand people sold out. You know that that for, that for me was overwhelming. And all the young children there who, who go into that, I still see years later and say, oh, I remember coming to watch you play in the Echo Arena. So I think it, it'd be great if it did because it gives them something to go and see and aspire to. And you wouldn't have to go and travel outside their own city to see basketball at a high level. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm grateful for my time in Israel. You know, I, I came back to England from on, on the birth of my daughter and stopped playing in Europe. And I was just, I, I mean, fortunate enough to be able to continually play at, at a high level throughout these last couple of years. And hopefully I can get to continue for more. But um, the BBL, you know, from, from when I first came to it to the state to now, I can see the steps it's going and it, it is getting better year in, year out. We just need to get some more advertisement and stuff and get a few more things of that nature on board. Which leads me nicely to my next question. Do you feel that the, the BBL could be publicised more or get more media coverage? Or do you think, unfortunately, it may have had like a bit of a heyday? No, I mean, like I said, it is gradually... I, I do see the, the improvements, you know, each year. But, um, yeah, obviously it needs a lot more media coverage. It, it needs better, you know, uh, back end and stuff like that. And I think the infrastructure needs to be put in place for it to develop at, 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 a, at the rate it should be and at the level it should be. Because for the talent that we've got in this country alone, we, we should be one of the, the better leagues in Europe. Would you say in the BBL at the moment there's a standout poster boy maybe to lead that? In terms of teams or...? Well, maybe teams or a player individually. Well, uh, no, I mean, when, when we talk of teams, you know, you just look at the teams that have had longevity and success. Newcastle, Leicester have been doing really well. You know, teams that have always um, been able to stay at that top level and maintain. Because like you said, with the Mesa Tigers, we had a really great season, but they're kind of dwindled off after that. So maybe, you know, taking a look at the teams that have been there for a while and done it and maybe see where, you know, where, what they're doing and try and maybe rig it a bit to go on the same path as them. Now, this is your first season here at the Cheshire Phoenix. You did travel over from Manchester Giants. Uh, so coming from the, the Giants to the Knicks would be like kind of going from United to Liverpool. So how welcoming was he here? Uh, the fans here are great. I mean, I've always, every time I played against Chester, even when I was with the, the Tigers or with the Giants, I've always had a really nice reception. You know, the, the Cheshire fans are really nice and uh, they've been warm and, you know, and it's, been a, it's been great to be a part of it, to be honest. You know, we get a great following on the road. To be honest, I think maybe besides Newcastle, I don't think anybody gets uh, an away following like we do at Cheshire. So I've been lucky in that sense and couldn't ask for better fans. Um, it's, we're at a stage now where it's the end of, pretty much the end of the season. Mm. Uh, so personally, yourself, how do you feel it's gone? Um, I think, you know, it's, well, just taking a look back, just, just focusing on Cheshire, you know, as far as I'm aware, it's the best season they've had for, for a long time. So, you know, I think it's gone uh, well all in all. It's not over yet, so hopefully we can still win, uh, make a push and win the playoffs and end it um, on a high note. But no, I think it's gone well overall. You know, we're, in, you know, we're pushing for third. We've made a top eight for the playoffs. Um, we've got a good chance of getting to the finals. So it's still right there. And I think we've had a really good season, considering you know, some of the changes that we've had to make throughout the course of the year. Now, notably, one of the changes there is head coach. Uh, head coach John Cofino came in at the start of the season. A couple of games in, obviously. 
How do you feel that the coach's first year in the BBL has gone? I mean, he's done great. I mean, for the first year in the BBL to put a team into third, fourth place, making the playoffs and having the best, you know, record that the, the club's had for a while, you know, we, it, it, the, the proof's in the pudding in terms of what he's accomplished. So, you know, he's, he's done really good for, you know, what we've we had going on and um, he, he's a great coach and a great guy and, you know, everybody respects him and hopefully we can carry on and make a push and win something and, you know, maybe show him our appreciation a bit by doing that. Um, I've always I've always been a big thing for youth development. I always like to give back to the you know the, the younger ones and help them on their path and maybe you know um, something to do like alongside with yourself. You know maybe like a, a sports panel or something along that nature. I mean, I'm open to suggestions, but I always want to try and give back to to the youth, especially you know from from where I'm from because I know they don't have the easiest ride there and there's not many opportunities for them. There's a bit there's more than when I was growing up, but it's still not the greatest place to you know get opportunities and you know and get get out of the situation you know make yourself better. So I always like to give back. So on that note, have you got any inspiring words for anyone watching this show wanting to make it big themselves? Just don't, um, just, just believe in yourself and put in the hard work because, you know, the work that you put in, it's, it's, it's going to pay off later on. You know, you might be tired sometimes or sometimes you have a lot of naysayers because I was always told that, you know, when you're from Liverpool, you, there's no way in the world you're going to be able to go to America and play basketball at that level. And that, that drove me and motivated me to prove people wrong and I was able to do it. So just don't ever give up and put in the work because if you put in the work, it does, it does reflect and it does show, show later on and just carry yourself in the right kind of way. David, thanks for joining us today. Thank you very much. Tell us, how did you get into basketball? How did you get into basketball? Uh, mostly from my cousin. Um, well, a lot of my older like cousins, uncles, and stuff like that, they played basketball. And they tried to get, it, get me into it when I was younger, but I actually declined it at first. Cause I want, you know, I was a little kid, wanted to play around. I wasn't trying to you know, do drills and all this stuff, but mostly just from my cousin and my uncle, I'd say that. Uh, my cousin, he played in college uh, at DePaul in uh, Chicago. He actually played in the NBA for 10 years too. So, you know, as I seen that, it was just something, you know, I wanted to do just to kind of follow in his footpath. And you made the decision to come to the Cheshire Phoenix and what made the BBL and the Phoenix for you? What was it that made you pick it? Um, just the way they welcomed me, you know, when they were actually kind of, you know, I would say recruiting me, it was just, you know, it felt comfortable. Like a lot of the people that have supported the team were, you know, t tweeting me, Facebooking me, you know, just trying to show support saying, you know, if you come here, we have your back, we support you. And, you know, the coaching staff, the owners and all that stuff, they showed a lot of support. And I felt like, you know, this was going to be a, a comfortable place for me where I can kind of play, you know, play a little bit in my game, show a little, a little bit more of what I can do. And also a good, just a good place, you know, where I can get a good long season in and a place where I can help move up in my career. And what's it been like serving under Coach Cofino this year? Uh, it's been really good. Uh, you know, he got a little bit of a little bit of mixture of everything, you know, coaching in the States, coaching a little bit over, uh, overseas. So it's been good playing for him, you know, like I say. He kind of, he, he lets me play. He lets me play to my strengths. And he also kind of, you know, kind of lets me go a little bit outside of the box just to kind of help me, you know, work on a little bit more. He's been teaching me a lot, offensively, defensively, just, you know, the knowledge of the game, just his, his knowledge period has just has been helping me out a lot. You know, the team, he's been coaching the team, I think, pretty well. And just, you know, playing under him has been, I think, big for me. You know, you can tell by how I've been playing this year. Well, talking of that, you've picked up a few players at the month awards there, so you've obviously been playing well. How do you feel the BBL as a whole, as a league is to play in? Uh, actually, it's a lot better than what I thought. You know, coming into here, I kind of asked around. People were saying, you know, it wasn't really as competitive. But I think this year, it's been really competitive. I don't, you know, I don't know about the other years that's been playing, but I think this year has been really competitive. A lot of teams been beating. Pretty much every team's been beating every team. So you know, even though Newcastle's been kind of click up favorite, I think you know, just in the playoffs now, one through seven, one through eight, I think a team can just get hot and you know, go to the finals and win it all. So it's not like a clear cut, you know, this team is just going to win it. So everybody just, you know, kind of packing in. I think just how competitive it is and just everybody beating everybody, everybody's coming in the playoffs with confidence and they feel they can win games. And have you got any inspiring words for the young viewers out there who want to take up basketball? Uh, some inspiring words, I would say, is to listen to your coaches and your trainers. Always work hard every day and play every game like it's your last because you never know when it would be your last game. So. Some good words I say. 
Hello and welcome to the Farnham Report. Uh, let me just apologise first of all for my voice. I might have been on a bit of a heavy weekend and I don't have much of a voice left. But let's get into it. Baffa Prem North, Lancashire Wolverines, team from just up the road. Uh, they had a great weekend. They've gone 2-0 and now after an outstanding win during week one. They've managed to pick up another win on the road. They beat the Yorkshire Rams 50-0. It was the, the War of the Roses as Yorkshire takes on uh, Lancashire. But it didn't work out well for Yorkshire. They, the Rams just not having a good place right now. They seem to be on a, a bit of a, a downward spiral after a heavy defeat last week. Makes it interesting though for the division because you've got Tamworth who is still there and you've got East Kilbride who is still going to have a say. Um, it's going to be a good division to keep your eye on this uh, Prem North. It's going to be some good rivalries built this year. Closer to home, Merseyside Nighthawks, as you can see over my shoulder, they've gone a 3-0. They managed to pick up a fantastic win this weekend as they took on the Shropshire Revolution. They won 71 points to 7. Um, and I'm not going to say they're an outstanding ground game. They basically just run all over the Shropshire Revolution. Uh, the running, they're, they're running backs had a total of 7 touchdowns, which is a huge amount. And it shows that the Nighthawks have more than just the quarterback because for a long time they've been a passing team. Now they've started running the ball efficiently as well. Uh, Lauren managed to take uh, four of those touchdowns every single one of them 15 yards was the shortest he went in from it, it was a close game apparently until the first play that the Nighthawks got the ball on our fence and that was running for a touchdown from some distance um, as I said pattern of the game was basically the fact that the Nighthawks got the ball and they ran it straight down the Shropshire Revolution's end every single time and scored uh, that takes the Nighthawks to 3-0 as I've said and that means that they're currently on an unbeaten streak of 16 um, down in Chester things went from bad to worse they played the Edinburgh Wolves and that was not a good game for them it started off okay um, they kind of fell out of the game by about half time they were down 20 points to 6 they scored just before half time it gave them a little bit of hope and you felt like maybe they could find their way back into this game maybe they could get something more out of it but that wasn't to be. Uh, the second half was a really, really strong defensive battle for two, both teams. Both teams worked really, really hard on D. Um, there was only one more touchdown, and that means uh, the Edinburgh Wolves took that, and then they got a safety late on as well. So the final score in that game was 29-6. Uh, it, as I said, it's a big, big thing for, for Chester now. They've got a massive uphill battle to try and pull this season back together. They were 0-3, uh, and that's not a good place to be right now. What can I say for the, the Halton Spartans though, they are definitely a new team, they are here and they are here to stay, they, they managed to travel all the way up to Carlisle, Carlisle Sentinels haven't been around for a while uh, either, they've been around under different names but not played for the last few seasons, um, they come off a big win last weekend, Halton Spartans travelled all their way up and uh, managed to pick, take a, a massive defensive battle, they managed to take it with an 8-0 win. Uh, it's great news for Holton, they, they've seemed to come into this league and hit the ground running. They spent a year in development last year, so it's really, really good to see that that year they spent developing the team has, has worked well for them, and they, they're coming straight through uh, and doing well. They've got a big game next week against Manchester, huge rivalry game. If you get a chance, get across there and watch that. I do believe that's the only game that's even close to Merseyside this weekend, so you need to go across and watch that. Sorry guys, you might have to travel to Manchester. Yeah, in baseball, uh, you can go see the Liverpool Trojans on Sunday though. They're playing as of 12 o'clock. They hosted two games back to back and they're playing against the Carmel Valley Lions. They've already played this season and Carmel beat them twice. One of those games was a 10-9 game, so get a chance. Go down there and watch that. I have it on good authority as well that the first 1,000 fans get in for free. So if you get a chance, get down to Bootle Stadium. On the other side of the Atlantic, uh, if you get a chance this weekend, check out your TV listings because there's some big, big stuff happening over there. The NBA playoffs is uh, the NBA playoffs is coming to to a head, so get a chance to go watch that. Is LeBron going to be there? Who knows? You'll know by the time you see this. Uh, and you've also got the NHL, the Stanley Cup final. The teams will be decided by the time you get there. This is the Farnham Report. See you next week. We're at a part of uh, the year that I really enjoy. It's Stanley Cup time. Oh, yes. It started. Oh. It started. The playoffs have started. And, uh, Did they never finish, though? They never finish. <laughs> never, not in hockey. Um, for those of you who, who, who haven't seen any Stanley Cup uh, playoff stuff before, it's the longest thing in the history of the world. But, it, but it's so competitive. Playoffs, they're just awesome. Do you know what? I can't <laughs> believe that. Playoffs so many are people. not awesome. Will yeah. you stop going on about the playoffs not being awesome? What is wrong with the playoff? This is a view from left field. <laughs> oh. And I'll tell you why I've got this view from left field this week. It's because my legs have gone numb, sitting here forever, waiting for all these seasons to finally end so we can go home, <laughs> but it just won't end. 
It's a Sisters Fian task, a pointless pushing of a rock up a hill, only for Abbott to fall right back down again. An un endless procession of unsatisfying conclusions, usually ending in a final game that no one wants to see in a never ending pursuit of the almighty dollar. That's the, that, is the, that is the fundamental problem with the post seasons. Once upon a time, it did mean something. You mentioned the World Series, the grandfather of the post-seasons. <laughs> Baseball used to be the National League and the American League, and they played a full schedule between themselves. Never the twain did meet until one day someone said, well, we've got two competing leagues here. Why don't we see who the best team is? So the winner of League One played the winner of League Two, and they found out who the best team was. And it was good. It was a game that meant something. You could say, legitimately, you were the champions of baseball. But that wasn't enough. Because you know what? That game made money. Did you see the money that game made? <laughs> if we had some more of these games, maybe we could make more money. And that's what sport's about. I've said it before on The View. Sport is about making money. That is its purpose, surely. Otherwise, we wouldn't be in it the way we are. So, well, this league structure is no good because that's only giving you two teams. Let's let's split these leagues up. We'll have divisions here and divisions there, and there'll be little mini leagues within the big league. And the winners of these little mini leagues, they can play some post-season games <laughs> against each other. <laughs> and these. Winners of these divisions, they can play some post-season games against each other. Then we can have semi-finals here and semi-finals <laughs> there. And then we can have the meeting in a grand final. And it, the game might be against two teams that finished or, that, that had the fourth or fifth best record in their respective leagues. And they can't legitimately claim to be the best league team in that league. But you know what? That doesn't matter because we've managed to grind this out <laughs> over a series of months and we've made so much TV money and it stopped being the entertaining sprint, the you know, the quick game to a, the with the fast, satisfying outcome of being the best that the fans used to crave. And we've got this endless, exhausting grind of the NHL playoffs and the NHL playoffs will let anyone in as long as they finish halfway up their league. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm ending this view on a downer because as I've said, I'm exhausted. My legs are asleep and I've been sitting here for 10 months. <laughs> well I don't, done. I don't feel like watching any postseason. <laughs>